Good morning, church. Welcome this morning. It's so good that you're here. Just sitting with my good friend Roger, and the word just popped into my spirit, yes. It's because Jesus said yes to come on our behalf, that we get to say yes. <laughs> we show up for you, Jesus, not just Sunday morning, but every day. And so this morning you're invited to just stamp your yes on the yes of Jesus, on the yes of the Holy Spirit. He's here with us. Yeah, the kingdom of God is here. And so just as we prepare for worship this morning, just on purpose, in faith, say yes. Say yes in your heart, through your body language, through your praise. Let's pray. Father, we come in Jesus' name. And we only come because you came for us. You arrived at just the right time on our behalf. You said yes. You're obedient to the Father and the will of your precious Father. You said yes. And so, Lord, by the power of your Spirit living in us, we say yes to you. We agree for everything that you ordained for our lives and for this time that we meet together right now in this special way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the King. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? King of glory. King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder Who leaves us breathless In awe and wonder King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace this is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory, the King above all kings the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was 
ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. And you will be praised. and saints always oh, sing worthy are you Lord and we will be praised and you will be praised with angels and saints and we sing worthy are you Lord and you will be praised and you will be praised with angels and saints and we sing worthy Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my Ever be on my lips, your praise. Ever be on my lips, you will. Ever be on my lips, and you will be praised. And you will be praised. Oh, with angels and saints, that we sing worthy. Are you Lord? And you will be praised. And you will be praised. And saints, God, we sing worthy are you, Lord, and you will be praised. And you will be praised with angels and saints. We sing worthy are you, Lord, and you will be praised. You will be praised with angels and saints, and we sing. in this place, Jesus. God, there's this great cloud of witnesses that are standing around. The cloud of witnesses is cheering us on, Father, this morning. 
those that have gone before us. Those that we feel we've lost, Father, they're up with you. <laughs> they are so, so keen for us. God, they join in. They join in with the angels, with angels and saints, and we sing, Worthy are you. <laughs> yeah, you're worthy, Jesus. <laughs> An almighty fortress And you go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God Shine in the shadow You win every battle And nothing can stand against the power
I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. May our hands lift it high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I'll lay at your feet. Loretta just came and told me a picture she got just now and, I, and I've just seen the same thing and maybe some of you have as well but it was a picture of a, squ a squadron, uh, an army literally marching and I'm not sure what we do with that right now, whether that's something that we need to actually do physically, uh, where you're at just kind of marching in step or whether it's just something for you internally to process. So just. that to the Lord. Lord, what's my part in this army? <laughs> the battle belongs to the Lord, but he's called us as his foot soldiers, as members of his squadron. What's my part in your army, Lord? It was like this army had all their armour on, and they're standing in a big square, and they're, they're totally clothed in all their armour, and together in unison, they're marching like this, but they're not just marching, they're stomping like a like a sword or an arrow and it's like they're declaring things in the in the heavenlies and it's like as they stop there's things being broken off in the spirit and, and I feel like God's saying to us I want you to march you you are you're my church you're, you're my ecclesia you're you're my army and I want you to stand in your armor and march and break off the things over you and over this um, community, over this nation. We declare the glory of the Lord. We declare the authority of God over this nation. Stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. No mighty fortress. If you go before us, nothing can stand against the power.
fear I lay at your feet I sing to the night oh God the battle belongs to you
scripture this morning that uh, God could do exceedingly more than we could think or imagine or comprehend. And that that promise would go through from generation to generation to generation to generation. So that scripture, that word was passed on to us. That God's going to do it exceedingly more than we can imagine. And we're pretty good at imagining stuff. But God can do exceedingly more than that. And I can't imagine that. <laughs> God, you're good. You are a miracle working God. You working God you are a miracle 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 working God
right now are waiting for promises to be fulfilled you're waiting for the yes from heaven and um, just a word that Fiona shared I think it's time to pray for one another so we're not going to draw this out but I just want you to turn to your neighbor beside you and just pray just pray pray that the promises of God over this person's life would be known would be fulfilled would come yeah bless one another just briefly as we continue in worship to that um this week when i was um spending some time with god he showed me angels come into my living room um and he told me they were coming because they were waiting to be commissioned to tell them what to do so just i felt to share this at some point this morning but just as we're praying that's what we're doing angels literally are waiting for us to commission them to achieve god's will in the earth so just yeah God isn't just a miracle working God he's a God who keeps his miracles 36 years ago my heart was broken and God gave me that scripture beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness a couple of months ago in this church I realized that God had done that he had given me beauty for ashes the oil of joy for my mourning and a garment of praise for my spirit of heaviness. The other day I was looking through prophecies that different ones had given to me and in this one that I was reading it said that God was going to bring me to a quiet, restful place and that he was going to restore me. And I looked around we're living in a caravan at Killip's place at the moment and there in front of me is a little pond with lots of ducks on it and it's such a serene quiet restful place and I realized that God had brought me to that place that he had promised he's a God who always keeps his promises 
might take a while, but we have to wait. Thanks. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way that the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be in this reckoning And I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters. He's holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how you've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden. Another in the 
principality, no power, no death, no life. Nothing stands between us, no. Nothing stands between us. Not my sin, not my shame. It's been paid for, it's been taken all away. Stairs between us. Oh, nothing stands between. Sing it out, sing. Nothing stands between. Sunday morning and I loved it but I found that I would come every Sunday morning 
and particularly as a new Christian, I would sit there over holding the elements and I would go through everything that I'd done wrong that week and I would bring them all to the Lord because I knew there was a scripture there somewhere that said that I needed to examine myself before I took communion. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I'm going to just put that down. In, second Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks to the church in Corinth about communion and he talks about how Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you come together and you do this in remembrance of me, you are proclaiming my death until I come again. And it does go on and it does say that we are to examine ourselves and we're not to take communion in an unworthy manner. And so we do. But as Christians, we should be constantly coming before God. We can't live at the foot of the cross because Jesus didn't live at the foot of the cross. Jesus, we, we sit at the tomb. We sit at an empty tomb and we proclaim the death and the resurrection of Jesus until he comes again. And that's what we've been singing about this morning. We've been singing about his promises and his goodness. And proclaim is not an inward reflection word. Proclaiming is an active and it's a doing word. And that's what we need to be doing this morning. As we come to the table, it doesn't matter if we take communion together once a month or if we take communion together once a week. We are doing the work that Jesus told us to do. We are proclaiming his goodness and his promises and his faithfulness until he comes again. We have communion here this morning. So we are going to bring the tables out. Just when you feel ready, if you want to proclaim his goodness, you can do it loudly, you can do it quietly. He has got promises that he is faithful to. Why? Because of the work that he's already done on the cross. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the work that you've done for us. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that you walked out of that grave. We thank you that you didn't stay on the cross because forgiveness for our sins was one thing, Father, and we are so, so grateful for that. But we are thank you for the, thankful for the life that you have given us to live. In taking this, Father, we proclaim you. We proclaim your goodness. We proclaim your forgiveness. We proclaim your salvation. We proclaim your life. And all that you have done for us through that, we proclaim your promises as truth. And we proclaim your, your goodness until you come again.
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Wow. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let's just give him a shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy. There's no other. There's no other. He alone is worthy. (laughs) He alone is worthy. And that, (laughs) you know, when we shout like that, that's just a little, we're just scratching the surface, right, of what's going on in heaven right now, of the party, of the rejoicing, of the celebration, of the praise that is lifted into the throne and to him who is on the throne and the lamb that was slain. Woo. <laughs> oh, Lord. We, we, just, we are yours. We are yours and we say you are worthy. And we bless you, Lord God. And we, we thank you, Father, that, that we get to partake in, Lord, what the angels and saints are doing right now, Lord, singing around your throne, worshipping you, Lord, for all of eternity, that we join in with their voices. And the veil, the, the space between heaven and earth grows thin. And we hear their roar, Lord God, and we join in. And we join in, Father God. Ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. How good is he? How good is he? Wow. Thank you, team. Thank you, team. Good morning, everyone. And we trust that you are, you are welcome. You feel welcome. <laughs> welcome in the presence of the Lord. If you're new or visiting here, a special welcome to you. It's great that you're with us. Uh, this is Flame Tree, and we are a people called to worship the King, to, 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 to know his presence and to carry his presence into the world in, in real and, and relevant ways today. So we're just so glad that you're here with us. Um, I'm going to ask, we've got a couple of people sharing this morning. Where's, where's Beck? Beck, come and, come and um, share with the house what the, Lord's, what's, what the Lord is having you doing lately. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Hi, everybody. Um, so last year, I shared a little bit about um, Fireflies um, Learning Hub. Um, the launch was supposed to be last year in February, <laughs> but God had other plans, right? Um, so I was doing most of the prep stuff last year and then um, about term three we kind of launched off with a um, parents meet up on a Thursday afternoon and we had eight families, started with the Flame Tree homeschooling families because um, the Um, My vision was to get um, homeschool families together and to support them in um, homeschooling their kids, but while they're homeschooling their kids, but also to disciple them, like so more intentionally because they've chosen to homeschool. um, The Christian families, that is, they want to impart biblical 
founda- a solid biblical foundation, so I really felt on my heart to get behind them. Um, and yeah, and so we started with a um, meet up on a Thursday every fortnight, and we had some families coming, and then term four we had more families coming, so we had about 15 families all up and about 30 kids coming um, by the end of last year. Um, and then we started to, we had a discussion about um, whether we wanted to grow and expand into like a more co-op situation where, um, so if you don't know what a co-op is, it's where families get together and they kind of share the teaching load and kind of, yeah, collaborate. So, which is great, right? <laughs> Sharing the load is always a good idea. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we had, um, so I had a small team that I was meeting with at the end of last year. So, and the timing was was like literally to the day um, was nine months exactly the con- when I tried to launch and then the conversation I had with the parents where we're like, yes, let's do this. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> um, so that was pretty cool because um, nine means, you know, birthing or season of life. Um, and then, so yeah, so a tricky period over Christmas and New Year trying to organise the starting of it. Um, but it was just like God was so on it. And I'm like, okay, it's now. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, So we, yeah, we hashed out ideas, um, got ready for the start of the first week. The weekend before our first um, meet up, we decided to do it weekly this year um, and extend the time that we were meeting for. So just still doing Thursday afternoons. Um, but the, yeah, the weekend before, um, Renee was on the chat and there were parents all commenting interested in a teens group because we were just aiming at primary kids and then some stuff for the younger ones to do while the um, other kids were doing stuff. And um, there was like a whole bunch of parents. So we had all these teens just come on the first day and Renee just jumped in and <laughs> had a brainstorm session with them. So now we have a teens group as well. Um, and that Tuesday before the Thursday, I literally only had RSVPs from none of our regular families, only new families, and there were 10 new families, and I'm like, okay, God, uh, I think we're going to like, because no offence homeschoolers in the room, but (laughs) they're not the greatest at (laughs) RSVPing, so it's usually late minute, last minute. Um, So I'm thinking, uh uh-oh, and I felt the Holy Spirit go, you need to check if the cafe's free because we were going to just do it in the back so that we could use the shed and stuff, try and do it in there, would not have been big enough. Um, So I checked with Tim on Tuesday, I'm like, I think we're going to be bigger than I think. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and then so put out the last advertisement like that um, that day, and then, yeah, by Thursday, we had 30 families come and 72 kids. (laughs) So... (laughs) Needless to say, we were, I was a bit run off my feet because <laughs> we weren't prepared for that. <laughs> so we literally like doubled and uh, like seriously, it's, it's just so God. And last year for me personally was a little frustrating because it was quite like the team in the church knows. It was very frustrating for me because it was a lot of time with God and a lot of behind the scenes and nothing actually happening. So it felt like the seed under the ground, you know. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, and then all of a sudden it's just, yeah, taken off. And um, yeah, lo- like the families are just, it's just so God, hey. It's just so needed in this space. Um, and yeah, so so we're just kind of, we're meeting every week and then ideas to expand and we're gonna we're organizing an excursion day and yeah different things but all the parents are getting together they're all connecting they're all getting on board and it's about them actually running this not me so i'm just kind of helping to get it (laughs) going and then throwing in my two cents where i can help out and do stuff too so yeah yeah Just say, just say. I, I mean, Beck says she just throws her two cents in, but you, we know that you know movements like this don't happen unless someone has got the vision and the faith to step out and to pursue it. And so this has been a real journey for Beck, as she shared, like over a year of get from getting the vision until fruition. And now it's it's early days, and we I mean we're just thrilled. We've got 72 kids, there's 30 families, um, and a lot of them new families being connected into Flame Tree here on site through the week. So we bless you, Beck. 
Beck is, you know, um, for those of you who know Beck, she was a, a, a teacher. She, she set up a school in Thailand. Um, she's got a background in, in, in school chaplaincy. She's got a heart for worship and for the prophetic. And, uh, and so it's just a beautiful mix of gifts that the Lord has used in Beck's life to, to bring this about. And so we bless her. Um, this has been a faith step for her. And she's encountered costs, obviously, the, the parents pay into this. But if you're feeling stirred right now to sow into this ministry, then I want to encourage you to sow into Beck. There's been some um, unanticipated, more expensive costs in, in ways of insurance for her to do this. She can't come under the, the, the church insurance that we have here because it's, a, it's, a, it's another entity. Um, so if, if, that's, if, if something's stirring in you to be able to sow into this ministry, besides praying... And uh, pray for Beck, pray for these families. But if you want to serve financially, uh, come and see Beck as well. Or if you want to keep that anonymous, come and see us at the office. Uh, but we, we bless you, Lord. We just thank you for the vision that you've given this young woman. Lord, we bless her with it, Father, with the running of it, that you'd keep her in good health. In good health, Father God. Keep her strong. Keep her um, vital in your presence, Father God. And, and we thank you for this vision, Lord, of discipling whole families young people to faith and in their faith. And we just pray for a great harvest to come through fireflies in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to publicly acknowledge um, someone in the house anonymously um, supported me last year so that I could do the planning side of things and could launch things. So I just want to acknowledge them and say thank you. And other people who gave little bits as well, and especially the people who have been praying and I've, have been partnering with me because that was the shift too was where prayer was kicked in um, intentionally. So yeah, thank you. It's good. Good work. Thank you. Um, by the way, uh, after the service today down in the creek, we've got baptisms, uh, and so we've got five five um, children and teenagers. A couple of families through Firefly, through Flame Tree here are going to be baptised. So straight after the service, give us about ten minutes or so. Come on down to the creek and enjoy that moment. All right, Glennis, where are you? Beautiful Glennis. Come and share what, what you're up to and we're going to pray for Glennis. Um, I have a, a dream coming true which I didn't think would happen. I'm going to Thailand next week for a missions trip for three weeks. And um, I didn't think I'd ever be going back. Oh, my flights were cancelled in 2020 and I just laid it all down. But um, I've been supporting a ministry in North Thailand called Haven of Grace Home <clears throat> and I fundraise for them. And they rescue women and babies off the street that have been abandoned. And I was invited over there when I was still in Cambodia to help them uh, with the women who were starting to make product and sewing and craft and so forth, how to, get, how to market the goods and how to get them selling. Uh, because my project over in Cambodia, we saw a whole group of women come out of poverty through sewing and craft and God just breathed on the whole thing. So about six years ago, I helped them get started with the training and now they are um, launching a huge vocational training centre uh, in that ministry. And so I've been invited over there for the opening and I'm going next week and I'm very excited. Um, Libby uh, is in creche, otherwise she'd be here too, but Libby's travelling with me and she'll actually go across to Cambodia where I won't go this time, but she's going to bring my spiritual son across to Chiang Mai and we're going to have a week there together. So for me that's really exciting because I've been n nurturing this young man and supporting him for all these years since 2011. He was my tuk-tuk driver and he became my disciple. Now he's got his own ministry. He's got his own children's ministry and he's doing amazing things in Cambodia. So he'll come across and have the last week um, with us in Chiang Mai. And I'm expecting more divine appointments on this trip. Very excited. Thank you for praying. Father, we thank you for Glennis and we thank you, Lord, for the way that she's always running after you and running after the mission Lord, in your name. Father, thank you for just the DNA that she carries and the legacy that is on her life, Father God. And we, we pray great blessing on her as she goes. Lord Jesus, that you would um, just make the travel sweet uh, and, and the, the, um, the connections beautiful. 
Father God, that you would give her divine appointments, more and more divine appointments. Continue to make her aware, Lord Jesus. Uh, bless the work of her hands, Father God, and get great glory. Continue to get great glory from her life. We bless her. We bless her in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, bless her. You all know how amazing Glennis is, but if you want to know more about her work that she has done in overseas missions and just how amazing this woman of God actually is, she has her book for sale out there. She wouldn't tell you that, but it's actually one of the best books I've ever read. And to have someone like her sitting in our congregation, I just encourage you all to grab yourself a copy of her book um, before she goes. So good. Yeah. Oh, well... Hey, how are we doing? What a morning. So good, hey. I've actually, I've actually been away this week. I want to share with you guys. I was away for three days this week down to country Victoria, which was lovely. I was on a, a retreat with a mob called Building a Discipling Culture. And uh, these are discipling principles that, uh, that I've been involved with for the last three or four years. And some of, the, some of you in the house have been involved with that as well. And currently, for the last year, year and a half, I've been coaching leadership teams. Um, just two churches, a Uniting Church, beautiful Uniting Church down at uh, Adelaide. Shout out to Burnside City Uniting Church. Uh, coach them um, once a fortnight on Zoom. And also Windsor District Baptist Church. In Western Sydney, I get to coach those guys as well in um, building a discipling culture in their church and in their team. And, uh, and so this week, I was privileged to go to a retreat uh, with about 40 others who are also coaching, just normal people like you and I who uh, have been trained there. Our goal is to be practitioners in the way of Jesus, not experts necessarily with, you know, watertight theology, but actually practitioners uh, and discipling people to faith ourselves and encouraging uh, others around us to learn yeah, the ways, the words, the works of Jesus in discipling people to faith and growing in faith, becoming sons and daughters of the kingdom. And some of you have heard me talk about reading the Bible with someone, you know, discovery Bible method. Who's heard, heard, ever heard me say that? I've got a bit of work to do. That's okay. It's an amazing tool to disciple someone to faith. But the statistics from the BDC mob are, they're, and they're based in Melbourne, uh, is that um, over half the people involved in training clusters around Australia are reading the Bible with a non-Christian or with a pre-Christian right now, which is awesome. Yeah. Just a simple, simple measure of discipling people to faith. Get them uh, exposed to the Word of God through a trusted relationship a non-anxious presence, and uh, the Holy Spirit does the rest. It's not rocket science, but it does require our yes. That's not really what I want to talk about today. I might touch on some of those themes, but today is Purim. Or th this evening is the Eve of Purim, which is uh, the fifth feast in the Jewish calendar, starting with Rosh Hashanah. Purim is, is the, fifth, uh, the fifth feast. It's a two-day feast celebrating something amazing that happened in Israel's history. And normally Joel would be speaking on this, and Joel was going to speak on this, but Joel and Ginny have COVID. And so they're, they're, they're okay, but pray for them. Yeah, I know, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Who hasn't, though, right? I mean, come on. And so I, I got the call yesterday. Sorry? You haven't? Excellent. May you never get it. Yes. All right. So uh, this is a Saturday special for me. All right, I got the call yesterday from Pastor Joel, and so apologies. Some of you could preach on this a lot better than me, but this is going to be a stewy take on Purim. And uh, part of Joel's notes that he sent through to me made, did make sense to me, though, <laughs> that, that five, um, if I get this right, Yod is the fifth letter in the Jewish alphabet and is also um, uh, a, a pictograph for hand. And so it, 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 it speaks of the hand of God. And, and in the book of Esther, which is what the... Yeah, no, we're not going there yet, okay? It's Mordecai, anyway. Is it? What about Haman? <laughs> here we go. This is going to be a baptism by fire here. All right. This is going to be great. Okay. Um, where was I? Oh, Esther. There we go. You guys know that, that the, the, the name of God is not mentioned in that book. Yeah. And so it's like, but his actions, his activities uh, are all through the book of Esther. Yeah. 
Be consistent at least. <laughs> all right? All right? So there's the, the unseen hand of God through the story of, of Esther. And if you haven't read that for a little while, um, get into it this week. Read it, okay? But I'm going to kind of track through there a little bit. And, um, you know, Esther was written, was set uh, after some of the exiles had been released, okay? So some of the exiles that have been living in Babylon slash Persia have been released and gone back to Jerusalem. So it's set after the time of Ezra and the rebuilding of the temple, but before the time of Nehemiah. And uh, Nehemiah, you know, is a, the cupbearer to the king, and he goes back and rebuilds Jerusalem's walls. So it's, it's in that mix. Some of the exiles have returned home. Maybe some of the more orthodox, you know, the, the more we've got to get back to the promised land people, whereas others have stayed in the land of of Babylon, of Persia, and have continued on with their life. And that's where we pick up the story of, uh, of Esther. And, and just as the name of God is hidden in this book, it's almost like, to me, the sense is that some of these Jews are also hidden. In that we, we read that about Esther, that, that, that Mordecai advises her, don't let your Jewishness be known. They're kind of under the radar. And so they're, they're integrated into, into society. And Esther, as we know, you know the story, right? She gets selected, she gets recruited. She joins the harem, basically, of the, of the king. And she wins favour, it tells us. Yeah? All without her, she's kind of under the radar. Her Jewishness, her faith is not on display. And the other key character in the book of Esther is Mordecai. Yeah. Don't you love Mordecai? Yeah. Mordecai is great. We read in the early chapters that he uncovers a conspiracy that's aimed to kill the king, right? So he's like this no-nonsense guy, this hero, this unsung hero. He, but, but at the same time as uncovering this conspiracy and, and saving the life of the king, he slights the, the, the second-in-command right, of, of Susa, the capital, right, where the king lives. He, and his name is Haman. So Haman's got it in for Mordecai. Right? And we read, pick up the story where Hamas is like, he's out, he's out not only to get Mordecai, but he's out to kill all the Jews. All right? he, wa- he wants to wipe them off the face of the earth. In fact, it says in chapter 3, verse 19, not only kill us, get this, it says, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews. You know, if, if kill was, you know, that, that language just isn't strong enough. You know, we want to destroy, to kill, to annihilate them all. All right? He's, he's like, we're going to get this job done. And not only in that capital city, not only in that province, but in all the provinces, in every province of the empire, which, you know, what it includes back at Jerusalem, back in the home ground, includes everyone. And on a single day, this decree is given by the king. Yeah. And... Um, and it says, it says at the end of chapter 3, let me, let me read this. So Haman gets the king to sign this deal, right? Basically wiping out all the Jews, kill, destroy, annihilate them all in a single day in every province. And it says here, verse 15, um, that the couriers are sent out to all the province, right? The decree was issued. And, and it says, and the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Right? There's this, like, this sense that, what's going on here? They, they've made this decree, and, and then Haman and the, and, the, and the king sit down to have this, this, you know, this drink. And there's a lot of drinking that goes on, by the way, I noticed too. You know, there's a lot of, when the, the fact that Esther actually gets a Guernsey into the palace is because Vashti is, you know, she's like, she's not good, which came out of a drinking session for, for the king. Okay, so moral of the story, don't drink too much. Okay, you make dumb decisions. All right? But, but the rest of the city are going, what's going on? You know, what is with this decree? I'll get the picture there that it's not just the Jews, but it's the whole population are going, what? What the? You know, what, what's going on with this deal? And it, made, and it just caused me to think, you know, have you ever had times in your life when you actually don't know what the heck is going on? <laughs> you know, yeah. What? You know, when, when God seems hidden 
from your experience, from your circumstances, from, from your, this season of life. It might be, you know, as we've covered this morning, that the promise of God is given, but then there's a long, 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 long time in between its fulfillment. And in that, in that time, in that meantime, it seems like God's not only hidden, but he's silent. He may seem distant. And not only do, do you know, our prayers in that time, um, not, not only do they not seem to be answered, but, but sometimes the complete opposite might happen. <laughs> like, you know, this dream job that you've been praying for goes to somebody else. This aim, ailment that you've been praying healing for, you know, for yourself or someone else, seems to worsen. Or just literally, you might just be facing another month of just literally struggling to pay the bills. Lord, you said. Lord, you said. When God seems silent, distant. When life seems to be filled with unanswered prayer and unfulfilled promises. Yeah, I, think, I think we can relate. Yeah. And I've shared before about the wall. You know, some Christian writers talk about the wall that we encounter. Particularly... Particularly for new Christians, it can be quite astonishing. But we, but we all keep coming back to the wall. And what I mean by that is that, you know, when we come to faith, there's this emboldenedness. There's this uh, amazing, like, God, you're amazing. You're real. You're so good. I'm going to go out and change the world. I'm going to praise you with all that I've got. And then we hit the wall. <laughs> where, where it, see, it feels like, wow, God, you, you don't seem as amazing, as amazing as you did last week. Yeah. Or for those of us who have been journeying with Jesus for a while, you know, that, that wall might, might appear as in a real challenge. Like, you know, like children that won't, you know, respond to faith. You know, death, a death of a loved one. As I said before, like actually it's really struggling with the bills, the finances, like this wall that comes up, our circumstances, and we go, God, are you, are you really there? Because you really seem hidden right now. So when we've been flowing in God's will, and it comes to an abrupt halt, we've got more questions than answers, more uncertainty than hope. Am I, am I the only one? Does it ha happens to a few of you as well? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, particularly for new Christians, but for us as well, you know, the temptation there at that point when we encounter the wall is to, is to either despair or quit. Uh, it's to despair. Despair kind of looks like, Ah, oh, um, you know, God, you're not as amazing as I thought, or maybe there's something wrong with me, and we just stay stuck in this like ho hum, mediocre Christian life. Yeah. I'm not going to be like a super Christian. I guess those promises that you said in your word, they're for other people, but not for me. Yeah. Or, or we, or we tend to quit, right? We go, and and we see this, don't we? People come to faith, it's amazing, it's amazing, and then suddenly they've walked away, they've fallen away. Why? Oh, look. This, this happened or, you know, such a, this challenge came up and, and I just didn't feel God's presence anymore. And, and people who quit, you know, they tend to go, well, there's either something wrong with God or, again, there's something wrong with me. But I, I see the wall as rather than something for us to despair or quit is actually an invitation from God to, to move in deeper. First, we've got to ask, you know, where is this wall coming from? And, and if we're involved in, you know, if we're involved in habitual sin in our lives, then it, we might be opening ourselves up for a, a way for, for Satan to get in and really do us some trouble, right? So we've got to deal with that. But if that's not the case, then it may be an invitation from God himself, Holy Spirit, to actually draw us deeper into his presence. If the presence of God seems distant for you, come back to his promises. Hold fast to his promises. What are his promises? Well... And, and that came up this morning. But cl very clearly, Jesus himself says to his disciples, never will I leave you nor forsake you. Never will I leave you nor forsake you. And by the end of the story of Esther, we see that plain as day. God is, is faithful. Esther's story tells us that. I was reminded also of Psalm 23. As, uh, as David writes, you know, though I walk through, not if I walk through the valley of shadow of death, but though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? There's a wall there. There's this, this sense of like there's uncertainty, yeah? What does he say? 
I will fear no evil. I will fear, I will not fear. Why? Because you are with me. Because you are with me. When we encounter the wall, the temptation is to assume that God is not with us. Don't assume he's not with you. That triggers fear. He is always with you. Yeah. Put his promise before your perspective. Yeah. He is with you. He is for you. And if you're in a season right now where God seems hidden, where you're, you're between promise and fulfillment, can I encourage you? You know, even if you're encountering a wall of some sort, rejoice. <laughs> Let his praise be ever on your lips, regardless. Yeah. Because as we, as we do that, as we step through, as we respond to his invitation to go deeper, that's where the growth happens. That's where the growth happens for n even new Christians who encounter that. If, if they can understand, and, and it helps when someone's walking with them, but if they can understand that this is natural and this is normal, and actually it's a common experience, then they can be encouraged to go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push in. I'm going to press in. I'm going to, I'm going to pray anyway. I'm going to praise anyway. I'm still going to read the word. I'm still going to choose, you know, worship. I'm still going to, I'm still going to meet with the saints on a regular basis. I'm going to choose this way. And as a result, then we see the growth. There's also times when God seems hidden around us. In areas of influence, when we talk about, you know, the government and, and media and entertainment yeah, you know, increasingly in the West, we see a dearth of godlessness. Yeah, godlessness is rampant, and and actually, dear Colin came and shared a word that that's this is actually lining up, Colin. This is what I'm preaching. I don't know where you are, but you guys remember. Okay, let's have a quick history lesson, right? The first 300 years of Christianity, Christianity was on the margins, yeah, pushed aside, persecuted, even. From 300, mid-300s, when the Emperor Constantine adopted the Christian faith for his own, overnight it seemed that Christianity became mainstream. Some say that was the beginning of the end, and in some respects that would be right. But suddenly now Christianity and the Christian worldview is popular. It's cool to be Christian, man. All through that time, all through the Middle Ages, up until around 200, uh, 250, 300 years ago, the Christian worldview was the dominant worldview in the West. So if you were involved in art or politics or governance or anything to do in society, then it revolved around a Christian worldview. And for the last several hundred years that has been challenged, especially in the West, has been squeezed out to the side again. And we are again on the margins, as it were, of society. Yeah. Can I say that? That, you know, Australia has been declared a secular nation now. The dominant worldview around Australia is secularism. Yeah. It's not Christianity. And some of us get, oh, we want to go back. But actually, that ship has sailed in some respects. And so what do we do with that? <laughs> what do we do with that? Well, certainly from a de democratic, you know, our, our rights as citizens is that we can, we can um, speak up for our beliefs and our values, and we encourage you to do that, write to politicians when things are on, on the table for legislation, etc. There's always opportunities to do that. But I also think that we can learn something from people in the Bible who have lived in similar situations. Joseph, for instance, you know, as he's carried off to Egypt, was a loner. He was ostracised. He was not in the mainstream. We read the same about Daniel and his four friends and Esther. And in particular, Mordecai. Mordecai's example is an awesome example of you know, how to live under the current, you know, in society, but be true to your faith. You read about Mordecai, and he, you know, he's, a, he's, a strong, he's a strong man. He's raised Esther as his own because her mother and father weren't living. She's his cousin or his, or his niece. She's, she's family. But, but she beca he becomes more than a father to her. He's like a mentor or a spiritual father to her. Um, when I think of Mordecai, I think of Denzel Washington. He's a Denzel Washington kind of guy. You know, like he's, he's Denzel. Like that, that's what I get when I read about Mordecai in the scriptures, right? He's like, no nonsense. He knows what's what. He's ready to defend the helpless. He's like, he's going to step in when he needs to. But... But if he doesn't need to, then he's just going to, he's class. 
right? He's just, he hangs back. He's a good looking bloke. He's Denzel. He's a truth teller. I love this too. It tells us that he's, he's hanging around the king's gate. He's hanging around the king's gate, which gets him in trouble with Haman. Oh, some of you are still awake. That's good. But, um, but he's, he's loitering there. He's, he's, he's hanging out. He's seeing what can be done. Yeah? He's a non-anxious presence in that environment. And he's a truth teller. Think about all those qualities as we are living in an increasingly ostracized society you know, where our values are against the Christian worldview, where it becomes increasingly difficult in the West yet to hold to Christian values. The key, I believe, for, for Mordecai and for us in that is to trust in God, is trust in him. Yeah. Let me read from chapter 4 here, and these will be the most known portion of the book of Esther for you. Uh, when, when they get word of the decree to destroy, kill and annihilate all the Jews in every province on a single day, and, um, and Esther's in the palace and she's got favour, yep, but she's on tender hooks, right, because she can't just approach the king willy-nilly. It doesn't work like that. And so she's like, oh, what do I do? And so he says these words to Esther. He says, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows that you haven't come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I believe for every single one of us in these days that we are living we have an opportunity to respond to God's invitation to us as, as, as difficult as things can become and probably will become in the future, that we are here for such a time as this. You know, I, th- I thought it reminded me, uh, this mentoring, this you know, wise words that Mordecai gives to Esther, it, it reminded me of, uh, of Gandalf's words. If I can pull out a, a Lord of the Rings quote here. Yeah, from Denzel to Gandalf. Is that all right? Actually, I've been inspired to re-watch the Lord of the Rings movies. And so good. But you know the story when Frodo is saying to Gandalf, oh, I wish that ring hadn't come to me. I wish we didn't live in times like this. And what does Gandalf say? So do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. All right. All we have to do is to decide what to do with the time given to us, with the situations, with the circumstances, with the opportunities that is given to you for such a time as this. We are here yeah, and we get to learn to be truth tellers, trusting in God, a non-anxious presence, people who are loitering, looking for opportunities to own our faith, to speak our faith in non-judgmental, non-condemning, but also non-anxious ways, yeah, in real and relevant ways. And that's Mordecai. So when God seems hidden all around us, that's our invitation to shine the light even more um, in authentic ways. Let me just get to this and then we'll, we'll close. When God seems hidden by our own doing, uh, and this is, again, Esther's character comes out here. Esther, to me, you know, from Mordecai's advice, hiding her Jewishness, hiding her faith, it's almost like she's a, a Jew by stealth in the palace. Uh, and it's like, I th- I'm pretty sure Mordecai advised her to be that way in order to, you know, go the distance, yeah, to be, to be wise in that situation, um, to, to preserve her place of favour in the palace. And, and it, was, it strikes me as interesting. It strikes me as interesting because it, it almost contradicts uh, different approaches that I see in the, old, in the Old and New Testament. Can I share with you? You know, we, we've got the example of, of Daniel yeah, and Esther. And also I want to share with you an example of Elijah and Obadiah. All right? So you remember Daniel in chapter 6, the decree, again, another... Another king, Babylonian king this time, or maybe it was a Mede, Darius. I think it was a Mede, all right. He makes this decree at the behest, again, of his advisors that no one should bow to any other god, okay? And instead of going under the radar, what does Daniel do? He flings open the windows. 
He gets down at the time of prayer, morning, noon, and night, and prays toward Jerusalem. He goes, hang it, I'm going to do what I want. And as a result, gets thrown into the lion's den. Yep. And is subsequently rescued from then and then, and so on and so forth. You know the story. Esther, however, Esther is hidden. She's hiding, she's stealth here. But then she's challenged by Mordecai to speak up at the appropriate time. And so she's, she's surrendered. She uses language like, if I perish, then I perish. She's surrendered to the outcome of God. And we read that also of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, you know the story being thrown into the fiery furnace. And they said, well, if you throw us in there, that's okay. God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we still won't bow to your statue. Yeah. There's a surrenderedness there. And to some of you today, you might relate more to a Daniel or to an Esther. If you're relating to an Esther, that is that you might be in a, in a situation, maybe it's a work environment, where your faith is a little bit on the down low. You, you find that you're actually you, you're hiding, uh, not hiding your faith so much, but you're not actually coming out and being overt about your beliefs and your practices, your following of Jesus. If you are hidden like that, you, you need to know when to make yeah, a non-anxious, yes, but also an uncompromising stand for what you believe. Yeah. Then there's Elijah and Obadiah. And again, you can find this in 1 Kings 18. This sits out to me. You know, Elijah, he's a prophet of the Lord. He's like, he's, he's, has these amazing encounters, or right? the, the prophets of Baal, where he goes up against them and they get slaughtered. And he's, then he's scared of Jezebel and he's running for his life. Elijah carries on his shoulders the burden of all the people of God. You know, he's got the burden of the Lord, like, like any good prophet, right? And he's carrying that. He's the only one left, he says to the Lord. You're, yeah, I'm the only one left. And he's outside the system. He's not, he's not involved with that King Ahab. He's like, he's living rough. He's not got a nine to five job. He doesn't have a mortgage, right? He's living day to day. He's outside the system. He's the, that's the way to do it. But then we read about Obadiah <laughs> in the same chapter. Obadiah, it tells us, he served in the king's household, in the king's palace, King Ahab. He actually was employed by one of the most wicked kings of Israel. But it also says about Obadiah that he was a devout man. And no doubt, one of the 7,000 that God told Elijah that he has reserved for him that had not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah says, all on me. I've got to save the world. I'm the prophet. I'm the one sent by God. I'm the only one. And God says, no, actually, there's 7,000 others. And Obadiah, look at this guy. He's actually, he's in the system, but he's still a devout man. Yeah. God will use whomever he chooses, whenever he chooses, wherever he chooses, and however he chooses. And some of you will be used in overt situations where you'll be out there. You're called to leave your job. You're called to give up your home. You're called to live by faith. And you're outside the system. But some of you will be called to actually serve God from inside the system. Your walk will be more covert. Both are required in the house of God. Both are required in the kingdom. And the key for both is obedience. The key is to know what we're called to do, how we're called to live, how we're called to serve him, and obey it. And um, refrain from judging one another on the way. Why haven't you sold your house? Why haven't you given up your job? Live by faith. Well, because actually God's got me working for Queensland Health, or Education Queensland, or the Premier's Department. He's actually got me in the system to be salt and light in this system being devout yeah the overt ones love to quote deny yourself take up your cross and follow me and that is relevant and appropriate covert ones listen to this first thessalonians 4 11 to 12 make it your ambition to lead a quiet life to mind your own business and work with your hands so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody 
And for both overt and covert, be authentic. Be authentic in what God calls you to do. So let me just let me just share a little bit more on this. If you are if you are in a covert way, yep, let me challenge you to be intentional as you let your light shine. If you're in a covert situation where maybe you've got a new job and you haven't yet kind of shared with your co-workers that you follow Jesus, yep, or or maybe that might get you in trouble. Yep. If you're in, if you're covert and if you here's here's an interesting one. You have workmates who um, come to you and, and say, actually, my preferred pronoun is such and such and such and such. Are we going to correct them right on the spot and say, that's ridiculous? Or is a way of loving them in relationship, respecting that decision and still calling them by their name anyway, perhaps? What if you're in a job, and, and we see this more and more, where you've actually asked to wear a rainbow badge, rainbow sticker on your name badge? What does that look like? Yeah. These sort of challenges are going to come up again and again if you're in the workforce. Yeah. Yeah. How, how am I called to serve Jesus in this environment? Yeah. Putting him on the throne, not compromising in any way, but also respecting the needs and the wishes of my place of employment to a, to a point. Yeah. And for some of you, you'll line up on this side of the line, others will line up over here on this side of the line, and the key is obedience and non-judgment of one another. Yeah. Matthew 5.16 says, let your light shine. Yeah. So you're conspicuous, you're not hidden. Yeah. Like a, a lamp in a household or a city on a hill. Yeah. Recognising that if this is you, if you're in a covert mode that your career, that your studies, that your place of life is actually not about you. It's about the kingdom. And, uh, and it's about responding to God-given moments yeah, for such a time as this. Your, your challenge might be to actually get involved in the Great Commission, you know, making disciples that we're all called to. Make disciples. Seeing this as not, not an event or that you invite someone to, not a once-off, but is actually a lifestyle of being and bringing the good news to those around me. In that situation, in that context, you might be in a covert mode, but your, your goal is still, I'm making disciples here. I'm called to be and bring the good news to the people around me. Lord, today, how can I be the good news to my co-workers? How can I bring the good news to these people? If you're more of an overt person, you're outside the system, you've heeded the call, then I encourage you to back up your talk with walk. <laughs> yeah. Let it be authentic. Yeah. Let it be, um, yeah, let it be true. Yeah. And remember that God will have his way. That as, as Mordecai said to Esther, you know, if you don't do this, then God will, will achieve his purposes some other way, but your, your family will perish. Yeah. God will have his way. It's not up to you, but he will use you, sometimes in ways that we don't anticipate. And the invitation to us in that situation is simply to follow, is to obey him in natural, authentic ways. What does Jesus say? Let your light shine before men, Matthew 5, 16, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Not necessarily hear your good words or your impressive arguments, but that they may see your good deeds. And the result of that, that they would, they would be turned to the Father in heaven. It's interesting, when you talk with people outside the church, they naturally assume and expect that Christians are going to be kind people, people who care about others. Isn't that interesting? There's an expectation out there that we're going to be kind, caring people. Where do they get that from? Nikki, Nikki Gumbel says, kindness is love in work clothes. And you all know the quote, uh, St. Francis of Assisi says, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. Yeah. So for those who are over, used to being out there, sometimes we've just got to preach without using words, by loving and being kind. If we're covert ones, then sometimes we've got to find the words, you know, to share our faith 
to be and bring the good news to others. All right. The book of Esther is an amazing book. It's just, you know, you, Hollywood could not write a better screenplay with the twists and the turns, what, what the enemy sought to destroy. God just comes in. He fulfills his promises to his people. And, uh, and you guys know the story that Haman's um, attempt, yeah, to kill Mordecai is turned on its head. That's right. And Haman is destroyed and Mordecai is honoured. There we go. And then not, you know, the king can't retract that decree, but he can issue another decree for every Jew in every province on the single day to defend their property, to defend their livelihood. And so they do. And uh, with you know, similarly strong language, they're, they're given permission to destroy, kill and annihilate anyone who would come after them. Amazing, you know, 11th hour save on the part of God who is true to his promises. It's interesting, this is part of Joel's notes as well, 1953, when Stalin is working on the final solution yeah, to, what, to eradicate Jews from the communist empire. And just as those plans are kind of coming, coming to, to, to play, he dies uh, on Purim in 1953. Similarly, in the, the, uh, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War in 1990-1991, um, as Saddam Hussein is engaging Israel and, and firing rockets in, into there, they are overcome by the uh, coalition forces on Purim in 1991. God preserves his people. He's faithful to his promise to his first chosen people. He's faithful to his promises to you and to I as well. Yeah. He is good. He may seem hidden, but he never is. He is always there. He is always close. He is always speaking and he is always acting on our behalf. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your goodness, for your trustworthiness, for the way, Lord, that you have stepped into history and preserved your people, Israel, and for the way, Lord, that you step into our daily lives and not only preserve us, Lord God, but bring us your promises, that you bring them to bear. And so, Father, I pray for any in the house or watching on live stream today, Lord God, who are really, really struggling, Father, with your apparent silence or hiddenness, Lord, I pray, Father, that they would respond to your invitation to come closer, to step in deeper, to, to push in, Lord God, and, and to do that in community, to do that with help from others. Father, for those of us in, in work situations where it's, it's, it's getting a bit dicey or it might, it might get a bit dicey in days to come, please, Lord, I pray, give us wisdom to know what to say, what to do, how to respond in ways that glorify you, that are uncompromising to our faith, Lord, but also love and respect those people around us. We need such wisdom, Lord, at times. So, Father, we, we just bless you and we praise you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord God, as we, as we embark in this journey of uh, our Purim to Passover journey, Father God, Wednesdays, as we meet together as in homes, would you just bless and just bond relationships together? May they be knitted together. May they be the catalyst for encouragement, <laughs> one with another, Lord, as we share our daily walks, as we share the challenges, as we share the highlights, Father. Would you just bless each and every relationship, each and every conversation, each and every moment through this season, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Uh, bless you.